So, welcome Park City. Thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Corbin Crutchley. I am a staff front-end engineer at Descript. Uh, I'm a GitHub star. I'm an author of a book called The Framework Field Guide, which teaches React, Angular, and Vue all at the same time. Might be interesting to you. I'm also an open source maintainer. Let's hear it up for Tanstack, right? Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I maintain other projects such as Plop, Jimp, and what used to be called Unicorn Utterances. I should have updated the site, now called Playful Programming. Uh, and we're going to be talking about React 19. Now, React 19 is not out yet, um, but it changes a couple things. Um, it should be out soon, ideally. Uh, they're in release candidate stage. And it's going to change some APIs. It's going to add some new APIs. It's going to introduce some new concepts. And uh, it should fix some issues with web components. Uh, it's going to drop the need for forward ref, which is awesome. Uh, it also talks about, like, it also uh, allows you to ship uh, TypeScript types built in. No more at React, types React, no more at types React DOM. Uh, and there's few breaking changes to existing APIs. A lot of stuff is deprecated that they're removing ahead of time. Um, there's also better improved error handling, some other stuff that I won't be talking about today. Everything on this slide we won't be talking about today. Everything on this slide we will be talking about today. Cool? All right. So let's talk about the new APIs. What are they? There's a lot of them. There's use optimistic, there's cache, there's the use hook, which is a little confusingly named, but we'll, we'll touch on that. There's uh, use form status, use action state. There's the use client and use server directives. And then there's a lot of pre-connect, pre-fetch nonsense, whatchamacallits, right? So we'll touch on all the pre-connect uh, stuff in one slide, and then all the other stuff will get its own slides. There's also a new concept. There's form actions, there's uh, server components, async components, and then server actions, okay? So, let's start with use optimistic. Now, raise your hand if you've used start transition. That is a nobody. Oh, one person, woo! All right, start transition is an interesting API. It was re introduced, I believe, in React 18. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to tell React, hey, I'm doing something. I want you to treat this behavior as slow or blocking in some capacity or another, right? So what Use Optimistic does is it builds on top of start transition and allows you to say, hey, React, I'm in the middle of a behavior that I expect to go to the server and back. I want you to show a bit of UI that's an intermediary step between the two. So an example of this might be like a to-do list application, right? So you might have a list of to-dos, and you want to show the user that they've added to a to-do, but that it's in the middle of being sent to the server in order to, to save to the database and then return to the client, right? So what this looks like is we have a start transition with an await inside of the start transition. We have an add optimistic to-do, which basically says, hey, take the previous state of to-dos and add a new item to the array that says adding true. And then once it's done, set the to-dos to the, the list that is uh, the new value that is returned from the server. So what we can do is we can see this running in action. So this is our app.jsx. We can see that there's not a whole lot else. The only thing that we're doing is we're seeing if adding is true, go ahead and show sending to the server. So we can say, say hello, give a talk, and you can see that we have an uh, a bit of behavior that says that we should wait five seconds before returning a value. Seems like I have a bug in this code, but that's okay. We'll move on. Happens, live coding, right? So that's use optimistic. Uh, we're gonna talk about the cache function for a second. Now, this is a bit of a detour because ideally we should be talking about use hooks and some other stuff, but you have to understand the cache function in order to understand the use hook. Right? So what cache function allows you to do is allows you to cache values, uh, uh, runs of functions in between different uh, instantiations of that function. Right? So here we have an alert that takes a bit of props of an ID, right? and you can re-render the component, and even though we are calling the, the alert counter in the render, which you would expect to happen every time that there's a force re-render, it'll only execute the first time and any time the ID updates. So cache allows you to be very, very careful about when you rerun code versus not, right? So it caches errors, it caches all sorts of behaviors here. Uh, I actually don't know if I have a code example here, but um, yeah, so you can actually run this, and you'll see an alert that blocks the render, and then it'll finish rendering, 
and then you will re-render as many times as you want and it won't rerun the alert until you update the count and then it will rerun the alert. So this is pretty interesting. It's only really meant for server usage, not necessarily client usage, but we'll talk about that in a bit as well. Now, the use hook is really interesting. You can think of it as a wait inside of a client component, right? So you might have a promise that is returned from the server that you want to cache, right? So I'm going to go fetch a user from a database based off of their ID, and I want to display the user's information. But in order to do that, it's a promise, right? We can't display promises in the UI. We have to wait for them to finish. So what we do is we have our use hook that then throws up to the suspense. The suspense will throw, show the loading state. And then once that loading state is resolved, it'll go back into the, the uh, display user and show the name that is fetched from the database. Uh, so you're able to use suspense. Uh, and what's interesting about the use hook is that it can be called conditionally, which is not how most hooks work. This is the only hook that will be working this way. So you don't have to worry about like, ah, there's a whole new set of rules around hooks. It's just use allows you to be uh, selective about when you utilize it so it can be conditional. Use is also dual purpose, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you're able to use it with context. So instead of context dot, or use, uh, use context and then passing a context in, you can simply say use context. And suddenly, boom, you have a new value that's provided to you. Now, they also have talked about using other things uh, with use in the future. But you can think of the use hook as like a mechanism of extending React's functionality in order to use, which makes sense, uh, the, the underlying API, whether that's a promise, whether that's a context or whatnot, right? So let's get a little bit into concepts here, right? Here we have form actions. So raise your hand if you've heard of progressive hydration or, or enhancement, uh, any form of like, you know, JavaScript goes down and your application should, should still be able to work. If you're familiar with those concepts, you might be familiar with the uh, action, which is right there on the form. You might be familiar with the action API in HTML. What it does is it sends a REST request to your server and then returns back some JSON. Now, I'm showing a fully client-side example, but we'll touch on the server example in a second. But what you're able to do is instead of like, traditionally in React, you might have an on submit that has an event. You might prevent that default from preventing it from refreshing the page. And then you might be able to, to use your, your event, your form data to, to provide somehow, right? So notice here, we don't have any state for the input. We don't have any state for the submit. We're able to just have a submit button, grab the form data, use it to add to the to-do, and you're off to the races, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's also use form status, right? So you might want to know when you are submitting something, like if you have a delay of a second here. How do you know that you are doing something? How do you display that to the user? Because ultimately, the goal of any new API is to make your user experience better, right? So we have use form status. That allows us to see when we are uh, moving forward and taking an action. Um, it must be a child of the form element, so you can't just have use form status as like in app. You have to have it as the submit button. Uh, but this will allow you to display uh, submitting behavior. Also worth noting, this is being exported from React DOM, not React itself. Something to consider there. And then we have use action state. Use action state is interesting. Uh, it allows you to pass an initial value, and then from that initial value, you can return updates to that state through your action, right? That form action we were talking about earlier. So here, we have a say hi that returns a value from the action of say hello, and we're gonna wait a second before we do that. So what it's gonna do is when you hit submit, it will show uh, initial value, then it will wait that second and show value from the action in the state there, right? What's interesting is that you can even take previous state and add on to it. So say hi, let's see if I have that slide, I don't. You can say hi and accept a form value, and that form value can have a count, and then you can literally build a counter without having any use states, which is pretty interesting. I'll see if there's anything I missed. Yep. So. Let's talk about server code. We're going to be hearing a lot about RSCs and server code throughout the rest of this conference, and for good reason. There's a lot of movement towards this idea of like 
How can we make our applications, as I mentioned earlier, progressively enhanced so that when JavaScript isn't enabled, we're still able to do things? But also, we want to make sure that our applications are performant, right? And if a user is sitting staring at a loading spinner, that might be appropriate in some instances, maybe an internal dashboard, maybe some graphs or whatnot. But if you're looking for SEO optimized content, if you're looking for that fast initial response, the server is definitely where you should be going, right? So before I show the rest of these APIs, I do want to add a bit of a disclaimer. Next.js is not React, right? Many of these APIs are part of React, but Next.js builds on top of React. Uh, and while it's not entirely clear today what these APIs will look like in other frameworks, such as Remix or Tansac Start or whatnot, um, there is a general expectation that these are the standard APIs that are being exported from React. So I'm not going to talk about get cookie. I'm not going to talk about uh, any of these behaviors that might be exclusive to Next.js in this talk. So that said, let's talk about React server components in general, right? So this is a bit interesting. Like, the idea here is that you read from top, bottom, and then uh, left. I think I got that right. I hope I got my left and right. <laughs> right, right. But the idea is that you might construct JSX, that you designate there is some code that needs to run on the server that does not need to run on the client, and then there's some code that runs on the client that does need to be hydrated in order to have interactivity, right? Traditionally, this was a problem, because what would happen is you would have code that, that wasn't really designated explicitly for one or the other, so your code was assumed that it always needed to rerun on the client. So the problem is that instead of app and footer and header and search bar being static and not needing to re-render on the client once it hydrates, you would run your, your, your server generation, render all of the components, and then they would re-render again on the client. I had a blog application that had uh, like 10,000 DOM nodes because it was a really long blog post, and it was written in Next.js, and it was super slow because even though 9,000 of those DOM nodes were static paragraph tags, it would re-render all of them once it hit the client, right? RSC solved this problem. What they allow you to do is, like I said, mark and designate what needs to be on the server, what's on the client. So the server will rehydrate everything into HTML. And then once it hits the client, it can eagerly opt out of some uh, op operations that uh, need, are needed for interactivity. So how do we make a server component? Step one, use a framework that supports it. That is app router. End of list. <laughs> Step two, don't be using any state. No statefulness, no use reducer, no use state. Uh, step three, don't use any hooks that rely on uh, the client. No use effect, no use context. That is the end of the list. You now have a server component. Notice that we're using use ID here. This is still a hook. It is supported on the server. Not all hooks are not allowed in server components, but anything that requires statefulness or client code can't be ran in a server component, right? So then this begs the question, how do we, how do, we do the other one? How do we do client code, right? So step one, uh, add use client at the top of the file. Step two, uh, that's it, <laughs> right? We saw earlier uh, in the, the uh, AI and marriage talk that they added use client at the top. That's because there was now interactivity in that page that they needed to have interactivity for because of the state. That's what happened. So what we're able to do with uh, RSCs is that we're able to introduce async components. Async components only run on the server. There's no client uh, version of await for technical reasons. That's when you use the use hook. But what you can do is instead of fetching the user from the database on the client, you can await a promise on the server pass the, excuse me, pass the JSX to the client, and that's the only thing that is serialized and sent over the wire. That database call never makes it to the client. The only thing that makes it to the client is not even the full user object, just the name property in the paragraph tag there, right? So async components are pretty rad. We also have server actions. We talked about form actions before, how on the client you can have an action that, that then you don't have to use on submit or whatnot, right? But if you turn off JavaScript, that doesn't work anymore. You're on the client still. This enables you to have fully interactive pages, so long as they're within a form, that work without JavaScript enabled, even when writing React code, right? 
So here we have an add to do. We have some state on the server that is returned from the database using an await. And then we have an action that listens for the form data, right? That form data is then sent using a REST request, REST, yes, REST request uh, to the front end using uh, HTML standards. Those HTML standards then have like an RPC style functionality that then runs the add to do. We need to designate this function using use server. So use server doesn't designate a server component, it designates a server action, right? And then we are able to add the to do to the database, reload the page to itself, and suddenly we get fresh data. Pretty cool. Uh, we also are able to run this without JavaScript, like I had mentioned, and we can combine this with use action state uh, and use form status in order to get a lot of interactivity when the client uh, uh, JavaScript is enabled. Right? So like, you know, it's not a great experience to just see nothing and then suddenly the page refreshes with new data. That might be ideal rather than the page crashing, but you still want to show the interactivity elements when JavaScript is enabled, and that's why you can use those hooks with it. So earlier we were talking about the new APIs. We said that there was a lot of pre-connect, like connect, pre-load, pre-whatnot. What that allows you to do is there are APIs in the browser that allow you to prefetch uh, uh, like methods and, or, uh, sorry, modules and scripts and whatnot. This allows you to do that inside of JavaScript itself rather than in your HTML. So that's pretty handy if you're looking to eagerly optimize your server code. And finally, we can talk about web components. Has anyone here tried to use React with web components? Anyone here super familiar with web components? Okay, a couple of y'all. So the idea is that web components are a standard built into the browser that allow you to write components that look similar to a framework, but without any framework involved, right? So let's see if I can pull this up really quick. Yeah, so like SL range comes from a library called Shoelace, right? And they look just like components in React with the exception that they don't have capital letters, right? Historically, it's been very, very challenging to use React with web components. And luckily for us, web components now just work with React. Like you don't have to do any other additional customization. Like we can see here we have our range slider which we can move around, we can set it to zero, we can set it to 10, and it's bound to React state. Super nice, right? We've had problems with this historically. Um, so yeah, that is the majority of what I'm gonna be talking about. In fact, that's what I'm gonna be talking about in React 19. Uh, if you wanna come talk to me on, in the hallway, <laughs> uh, please do. I'm happy to talk a little bit more technical nuance about some of the things I wasn't able to cover today. Um, but in the meantime, if you're looking to learn React, if you want to expand your knowledge set to, to Vue and Angular, I wrote a book that's free called The Framework Field Guide. Uh, I'd love for you to check it out. Thanks, y'all.